I'm Laura Gavander with the Alchemy Cafe, and here we are sitting with Larry Carlson at his beautiful house in Bridgehampton, New York. Welcome, Larry. It's mm -hmm. nice to have you here. Well, it's nice to have you here. <laughs> yeah, I should say, I'm at your place, so... Um, well, you've been here before. I've been here before, mm -hmm. yes, and um, this, this spectacular property you have here, and I'm so curious to know, I understand you purchased it about 27 years ago, is that correct? So the, the uh, 1986. And uh, it's on five acres of land, and it was a potato field. Yeah, it is, uh, we drove past it probably in the early 80s, and for miles around in either, either direction, all the way to the ocean basically, Mecox Bay, and then up into the Glacier Moraine, and all the way down Scuttle Road, almost the full length of it, it was just all potato fields. And there was a little sign down by the side of this road that said five acres. We didn't know where it was in this great expanse. But um, we had a friend who was in the real estate business search it out. And one thing led to another. And we found out it was pushed way back into this farmland. Mm -hmm. So all our friends thought we were a little crazy because no one was up here. And uh, with the exception of just a few farmers and, and Walter Channing over at the Channing Daughters mm -hmm. Vineyards. Mm -hmm. So when you purchased the property, did you have the vision then of what this place was ultimately going to become? Yeah. You did? Yeah, for probably years or more, um, I was carrying around in my head, um, you know, something that when I, like what I call driving a straight stake in the ground, when you had your place one day. Mm -hmm. I, owned, I owned a lot of other places, but I was always moving. Mm -hmm. But I knew when I, you know, one day I would find the place and, you know, I put them all my heart, soul, and energy into it, and and uh, you know had a commitment to it that I didn't have to uh, mm -hmm. any of the other places. And fortunately for me, I had done quite a bit of traveling too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, prior to purchasing this, and most notably in France and Italy, and even more specifically in Italy. And I was very. Um, happy and pleased to be in that environment. There was something that the Italians seemed to have that the English didn't, and even the French, and you know, the English have all this exuberant, uh, you know, perennial borders and gardens, and it's a little bit more untended in some ways. Right. It's beautiful. And the French I call pruners, you know, they're crazy for the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the geometry and the rest. And, uh, and the Italians just seem to have old crumbling walls, they have terracotta roofs, they have brick terracotta you know, floor, stone, stucco, mm -hmm. and they seem to frame views quite naturally of an old church maybe through the courtyard. And a lot of thought and consideration goes into everything they do, even though it looks quite natural. And, mm -hmm. and they, they're, there's an absence of color too, to a great degree. You know, there may be a few roses spilling over an old mm -hmm. stone wall or some some poppies blooming in May in the right. fields, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a more subtle thing. Mm -hmm. So that was incorporated here mm -hmm. as fully as we could into everything that we, we did, both in the, uh, all the interiors, the buildings themselves, as well as all the, what I call garden rooms. Right. Now, the, the, the gardens and the landscape, I mean, it's such a spectacular kind of just the, the diversity of it. And so there's the physical element of it, but yet beyond that, there is this theme of connectedness, which I know, which, which is a big part of the creation. So whether it's connecting people, connecting people to each other, connecting people to the land, to nature, to ultimately to the universe, where did that inspiration or that, that theme, which is so prevalent in the property come from? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think that you know. I I, it, it, I think a hallmark or a word of of my youth, if you had to describe you know yourself, um, I, I and for me I think it was I, I felt lonely, mm. and uh, so as I grew and as I uh, get older. And I still had that as a, as a trait, you know, I, you know, I wasn't going to really get to know you and I wasn't certainly going to get you, let, to, let you know me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and that, that, that separateness or that apart from-ness, um, it, it is, you know, is, is a, it can be, you know, well, it isn't, it isn't a great, uh, way to lead a life, 
-hmm. And more and more, as I became more and more comfortable with myself, through a lot of work that I did, I grew to appreciate that probably the most important thing that we all can do as human beings is connect with each other and, you know, try to understand each other better. And so a minute ago you were saying, you know, it's connectedness here, and you mentioned connect to this, connect to that. Mm -hmm. The one that you didn't mention, which I think is what people feel sometimes when they walk through here, and they don't even say it, but I think that what they're doing is they're connecting to themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they, 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 they sense and feel something as they're moving through all these garden spaces or these rooms. And they, they, they know there's something here that appeals to them that's working on them. Oh, I have goosebumps as you say that because it's, it's really resonating and it's yeah. so true. Is that we always look for the external connections as opposed to really well, the most important is it starts with our connection with ourselves. Yeah, it's... Um, I, th I, I think uh, I think uh, it, there was a writing, I can't re remember who I could attribute it to, but I remember reading it thinking, wow, that is, it was a definition of a gardener. And a gardener is somebody that creates spaces that uh, allow people, you know, to connect to nature, but ultimately, you know, to themselves. You know, when we travel, mm -hmm. we're often thinking, I'm going to go find a new culture, I'm going to go find a new, you know, region, or I'm going to explore new areas and learn about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're outside of our comfort zone when we do that. We're out there and what all, always happens is that you find out that you actually aren't learning more about their culture, you're learning more about yourself. Mm -hmm. and you're learning more about how you're dealing in situations where you're not the most comfortable, where you don't know everything. Um, and, uh, and, and that I think is one of the real benefits of excursions or travel or adventures is that you know there's a lot of, a lot of self-discovery that comes mm -hmm. as a result mm -hmm. yeah so i had these two friends i think i've told you this before uh, patrice from france and ricardo from italy mm -hmm. and they came to stay here years after we built this it's about the 10th anniversary of this uh the, the villa des amis and they're the ones that gave it the name villa des mm -hmm. amis there was no name before they said this is a house for friends and of course that's what it has become over the years. And more and more people come here and more and more people use this place for things. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm delighted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm that delighted when they do. Yeah, because uh, that's, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the beauty of, mm -hmm. of having something. Is, is It's not actually yours. Anyway, it's the beauty of, it, of something, having something is to share it. Mm. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And so it seems like it's come full circle, you know, kind of where you started from this place and you created this, this incredible environment. And, um, well, every year we added some, another, what we call element. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's all percolating up here. I had a master plan for the whole five acres. Mm -hmm. It's more or less been executed, but things kind of evolve and, and, and modify mm -hmm. and change. Um, I, I was uh, actually looking and studying a French gardener, André Le Notre, who uh, was the head gardener of the Tuileries, it's a, mm -hmm. the gardens in Paris. Yeah, that's right. And his father was the head gardener before him, and his grandfather was the, uh, uh, you know, the head gardener originally. Mm -hmm. And André had the really good fortune to become the head gardener that coincided with the, the reign of someone named Louis XIV. And Louis had the idea to he wanted to have something called Versailles. Mm. So he whistled up the head gardener down in Paris and they built this magnificent garden. Mm. And then Andre went on to do Saint Cloud, Voli de Con, um, he did uh, Chanty. I mean, these are amazing and beautiful gardens. And, and uh, even though they're not Italian, which I was drawn to, I love the aesthetic of everything. Mm. And I remember you know, reading something that he had written as a definition of a garden. So I had it engraved in stone and I put it out here in the entrance to the gardens. And it really speak, it spoke to me so clearly that this is what I was trying to do. And Andre said that a garden should owe its charm to hidden realms and secret meeting places, mm. laying siege to a unity you sense but cannot find. And I thought, Wow, that's, that's, yeah. and people do, they wander around in these gardens, they go from room to room to room, almost always when we're about halfway through, they stop and they, they kind of are disoriented, mm. they, they, you know, they don't see it all at once, they just, if there's a discovery, and then they'll say, how, how much land do you have here? They, they think I have 
land. <laughs> Amazingly huge right. amounts it's of, the, of land. Yeah. But it's not. It's the way most uh, most of what I'll call American gardens kind of say hello to you all at once. You drive up mm -hmm. there. Right, it is. there it is. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and the ego sometimes says, this is right. my estate. Right. Exactly. You know, there's a the tennis court, this one right. cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, in point of fact, if you have it as, uh, as, a, as the Italians do so brilliantly well, I call it a coming in process. Mm -hmm. When you go to an Italian estate, you drive up some long gravel drive, you're usually going up through the cypress trees, you come to two big stone iron gates maybe, you come in mm -hmm. to the estate, you come it's in... A gentle Yeah, you come into yes. the forecourt. You come into the villa, you go into the courtyard, mm. you go into the garden. So you have to actually absorb it as opposed to being kind of in the face of it. Yeah, and, and, and you keep coming in, you keep coming in. There's right. a walled garden, there's a hidden garden, right. there's, a, there's another outbuilding. Oh, look over there, what's over that wall? There's always this invitation yes. to go oh, that's look a great more. Word. Yes. Yeah, it's an invitation. Yeah. And we've got throughout this property many of those little doors and windows and invitations in the rooms to say, come, come, come look here. Well, there's also, there's two really, two major structures, I'll call them, on the property that I think is really worth mentioning because they are so unusual. One is you have a labyrinth on your property, which is so spectacular. So I'm curious to know why you felt, why you wanted to have one actually on the property itself. Well, um, it wasn't part of the original plan. Mm. Uh, there happened to be a beautiful little open space meadow where it, it resides now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else. There's no other adornment there. You go through some hedges to come out into mm -hmm. it, and it's a you know rather a good surprise for most people. Mm -hmm. They're, they're kind of they, they say, "Oh, look, a maze," and, yeah. and, and it's not a maze. Right. A maze is something that's uh, you know usually has higher walls and it's designed to confa uh, confound and confuse you. There's dead ends. And, and you have to make decisions in a maze. You have to make decisions, yeah. yeah. And uh, and, and a labyrinth was something that intrigued me um, after I started this project. I started, uh, you know, appreciating them. I've seen them in different places. They're on church floors and cathedrals, usually in mosaic tiles. I wondered what they were or how they've evolved. And it, it turns out that these things started popping up all around the world at about the same time mm -hmm. in different cultures. And it's a, there's one way in, one way out. It's a spiritual walk. Mm -hmm. Um, many of the ones that were built in cathedrals were built to, um, were, were built because in the medieval times it wasn't safe to go on these religious pilgrimages. So they actually had a mm. pilgrimage on the floor. Interesting. But for me, you know, the connectedness, as we were talking about before, is connectedness to oneself. And a connectedness to oneself is often achieved, always achieved for thousands of years through meditation. And a labyrinth is part of that. It's a med it's a walk. You have no decisions to make, as you just right. said. It's one way in, and after you're walking, it takes about 20 minutes. And when you arrive at the center, you are centered much more. And this is a specific labyrinth. This is from Chartres Cathedral in, uh, in France. Yeah, a direct copy of it. Um, yeah, Did that would speak to you? you know, was that yeah, I like the layout of it. It's called 11th Circuit Labyrinth. It is the one that's in that cathedral. Um, my sister died uh, a little over 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and when she did, I, that, that was when I was moved to do something. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, it'd be nice to just to, you know, do something. And then a th thought occurred to me that, well, I've always wanted to try my hand at doing a labyrinth. So I laid all that out, cut the grass, and uh, people love coming over here and just walking the labyrinth. And uh, every day I mow the path, every week I mow the path, and every m Two or three times a month, the fellows that mow the grass mow at a much higher level. Mm -hmm. So it's always clipped, and it's been yeah, there it's now for pretty, ten years. It's pretty amazing, yeah. Yeah, there's a stone in the center which you don't discover until you get there, and it has an engraving on it too. And it says, "Sitting quietly, doing nothing. Spring comes, the grass grows by itself." Mm -hmm. It's fifteenth uh, century Chinese, I think, mm -hmm. from the Zenran Kushu. And you know that grass is going to go by. It's, everything's going to just go on by That's itself. True. And you know, while we like to think we're in control here, mm, things are moving on. Yeah, things are dying. 
things are changing out there every things are being birthed every day yeah. Yeah. so yeah. sad someone says oh you lost that tree well you know you know one of the, it, it, it all comes and goes it all comes and goes exactly. yeah so the other structure on the property which i didn't realize the name for it is a cenotaph which you said was a monument in, erected in honor of those in tune elsewhere and did i get that right yeah a cenotaph is a monument erected in honor of those who are entombed elsewhere. Entombed elsewhere, which is such an incredible statement. So, speak a little bit more about that, and and you know what what you know drove you to actually create that really amazing. Structure. Well, um, you know, um, we're 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 just here for a very short time, and we're all just passing through. In the larger scheme of things, we're here for just a very short space of time. And while we do learn things while we're here, we benefit enormously from those who have come before us. And if we want to take the time to reach into that deep treasure trove of, of, of uh, enlightenment, of intellect, of thought, it's there for us to go, go to. And, and uh, I was probably in my early 50s when I started to appreciate that there was so much out there that I did not know. And if I wanted to start looking, I could. And uh, when I was a very young man, I was... Uh, climbing in Yosemite and I was at the top of a place called Nevada Falls and I felt very connected to something I wasn't quite sure what it was but there was uh, some spiritual experience I was having there and I wanted to know more about sort of how that happened and I started studying how it was all preserved because it's an amazing place mm -hmm. and it happened to be a man named John Muir and so I started studying more and more about Muir and uh, found that he was connected in his thinking to those that came before him most notably a contemporary of his name, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Mm -hmm. And then Emerson in turn had been influenced by Shakespeare, Shakespeare in turn by you know, Kabir, Kabir by Rumi, these, all these by Marcus Aurelius, who mm -hmm. learned from Epictetus, uh, who, uh, who had been taught things from the readings of Ovid, Ovid and, and of course Socrates, and you know, Lao Tzu, and all the way back to a man named Arjuna, who was a real man, mm -hmm. uh, a Hindu warrior, uh, who was a central character in the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. And they all, in one way, shape, or form or another, were striving for something called unity consciousness, the appreciation that we're all one, we're all connected. And uh, so this became just the most wonderful journey I've taken. I studied and studied, and of course I learned subsequently the mere would pass these kinds of thoughts and thinkings on to another man who tried to prove it in, in a scientific manner, which was the unified field theory, um, Einstein, and uh, and then you know T. S. Eliot, who's a poet, did it in his poetry. And so anyway, there are sixteen men. Mm -hmm. I thought, wouldn't it be nice that they were such a big influence on my life if I they sort of honored it some way? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was how this whole big sculptural project evolved. And uh, it's, uh, it turns out to be a real popular thing for people to go out there and just sit. And there are a lot of elements to it. I've actually written a book about it, and it's being published uh, soon. Because it is a complicated, long story, far more time I'm than sure. we have here. But, I am uh, sure. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a collaboration with, uh, with a friend, Keith, who did the uh, sculptural works of mm -hmm. bronze and the ravens. And, stonemasons and Italian engravers with all the mm -hmm. engraving that was done and um, it's, it's a wonderful place just to go and sit and meditate so it's an, another element in the garden like the labyrinth mm -hmm. that has a spiritual connection it also has this it has this ability to you know pull people together we have full moon meditations mm -hmm. there uh, and with large groups of people and it's uh, yeah it's a really and, it, and it, it inspires conversation about yeah. it yeah you know, it's it's not just the the, uh, the 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 structure itself, but it's like what does it mean for people? What is it? You know, and it just kind of inspires people to connect further with that. Yeah, and and that has, um, yeah, and that's enriched my life. Mm. And you know, people, when they come here, they they, they want to know more about some of these things, and it does. Just like you and I are having a conversation right. about it. Right. And we've had these conversations before together. Yes. I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. So yeah. I'm so I'm so curious to know because you you obviously are very knowledgeable about a lot of these teachers and your your spiritual curiosity, 
Um, was this something that was always sort of prevalent in your life, or was there kind of like a, a turning point where you really wanted to delve into the exploration of this? Well, I, I remember in high school that uh, I, I didn't much like all the subjects I was studying, mm -hmm. with very little, uh, apart from drafts, me, drafting and architectural things that I was doing. And so I was constantly... You are an architect, correct? Yeah, that yeah, thinking? that's what I studied in school, and that's, that, and then, you know, I designed the house and gardens here, and mm -hmm. I've done actually six projects all over the world in different places, wow. which has been a really a lot of fun since I was able to retire early. And, mm -hmm. But when I was uh, when I was young and, and uh, going to school, I, I, one of the subjects that most interested me was uh, on one called world religions. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't particularly uh, religious in in, in, a, in, in, in or, but but the idea that there were so many different ones, right? And you know, how did all that happen and come about? And so I remember being introduced through the studies of those. That there were things outside of the Western realm that I was. And that included Taoism and Buddhism, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, while I was interested in those, I never really, uh, you know, had the time then with a career and family and everything to look into it. But to say when there was a turning point, probably in my, at around age 52, mm -hmm. I can still remember that was the year when I thought, gee, I've got the time to really start looking into some of this mm -hmm. stuff now. And uh, that's when I started really delving in, into it and looking at. Uh, and then, you know, it all, it's all connected. So one thread, yeah. you start pulling on one thread and it's gonna to lead to another. It's like opening Pandora's box. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, how I feel. Yeah, they, 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 they call, sometimes they call things, you know, there's a vicious circle. Mm. But actually in this particular case, it's, it's not, it's the opposite, it's a beautiful circle. Right. And it's a circle that just, you know, and that circle represents oneness. And uh, so the, the cenotaph is this big circle out there, like the labyrinth is a big circle out there. And it does, as you say, invite to lots of great conversation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, you know, and then we listen to each other and we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And that's the real, that's the real gift of, of uh, is experiential, you know, learning. But as I say with the cenotaph, if we take the time, there are some people who have already done a fair amount of work for us if we're willing to look for it. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's one man out there named Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm -hmm. Probably the most powerful sense I think I've ever heard. If you really want to think about that. So, and if you do think about it, then self-examination mm -hmm. um, is probably going to make life a lot more worth living. You know, trying to understand, you know, yourself and how you're hitched to the whole universe. Right. Once you get beyond all those things that we don't want to look at, then you see the beauty on the other side when you bring the light to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you were an architect, you still are an architect, and you designed the, the property and the house. And there's actually another, your, your artistic ability actually runs even deeper than that. And um, you retired from your previous career at around 49 years old, and you did something really interesting. You immersed yourself in this, um, well, art schooling. I mean, you can elaborate more as to what exactly that entailed, but it seems like you discovered a, a hidden talent that really was able to come out. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was so hidden. I mean, it was probably, it was something I always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I think we all have within us artistic talents of one shape, form, or another. You know, my wife is a pretty accomplished, well-known jazz singer, mm -hmm. and that was within her the whole time. And later in life, she you know, really started to explore that more, and, and now has been singing professionally for many years, and it gives her, I mean, the, never is she more happy mm -hmm. when, than when she's singing. And I think we're all pretty happy when we're doing something right. we can broadly call creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this, this creative spirit that probably exists within everybody whether it's a musical talent or a painting or collage or sculpture or mm -hmm. some, something is, uh, is, is, is a beautiful thing to try to explore and do more of. And all the, my career working, mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't really get to fulfill a lot of that. Oftentimes, the, you know, I studied architecture and I wanted to be an architect mm -hmm. and that probably would have done it. But, you know, life is just full of all these little doors that open and close, and sometimes you walk through one and everything changes. Mm -hmm. And I walked through one and became a draftsman in a small engineering firm, and the next thing I know I spent 30 years in the cable TV business. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so there, was no, uh, there was no drawing or painting or mm -hmm. architecture, there was, uh, 
there was a whole new expanding business filled with lots of uh, interesting creative things that were happening, but they weren't the same. And so all, I think all my career working, I knew that there, was, I want, uh, there were other things I wanted to do. So I set a goal for myself to try to retire at an early enough age to actually do those. But you weren't, you weren't actively allowing yourself to do the, use this creative expression, just in terms of, other than your work, just for the sake of the, the enjoyment of it. Is that, is it correct? Yeah, I didn't really have the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're going to really good, good, be good at something, I don't think you can just go to school one night a week on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. I mean, you certainly can, but I, I, when I left work, I, I, the very next day, there wasn't any pause in it. I knew where I went. I went to 89th and 5th at the uh, National Academy of Art. I walked right in there and met Nancy Little, who was the executive mm -hmm. director. I told her I was there to sign up for some classes, and she said, well, we have one here or there. I said, no, I'd like to go from 9 to 4 Monday <laughs> through Friday, you know, five days a week. And she kind of looked a little startled, but <laughs> we sure. did that. And for three years, I went there 9 to 4 Monday through Friday. For, three years? Yeah, for, wow. for, in, yeah, for school. And uh, yeah, and it was uh, it was a joy. Time flew, you know. When you're working on something, it just goes. And uh, I really, you know, connected to uh, a lot of what I had always had within me, which mm. is this desire to draw. I thought I'd be a great landscape watercolorist, and I kept walking by this one studio where they were doing life drawing. You know, there were models in there, and, and this is far more interesting than a landscape to me. Um, and so to be able to capture you and your spirit, uh, lightness is nice enough, but if I can get something more, that really comes up off the paper. That's a real... And, and so I started doing that, and then of course, I also gave, had the freedom of time to do things like this, uh, uh, which I always wanted to do, so I did. And then I had a lot of friends over the years that wanted me to do things for them, but I didn't have the time. So I ended up doing a project in Belgium. I did one in uh, Tuscany, uh, two old stone farmhouses and all the surrounding So the, the design that you're talking about architecture? Yeah, the renovation, the landscape design. Uh, I've done you know three or four projects of some size out here in, mm -hmm. in the Hamptons for different people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and it's it's a real yeah, it's a real labor of love. It's a real joy to, to do that. Uh, I think the thing that's most Difficult for young people, mm -hmm. um, and because I spent a lot of time trying to, you know, help and mentor young people too. I found that the most difficult thing, the biggest obstacle mm -hmm. to them getting on with it, is that they just don't know what they want to do. You know, if, if, if they do know what they want to do, it's great. They mm -hmm. go for it. But so many young people just say they just don't, are, don't know what they want to do. So it, it, it is this. Uh, it, it, that's the, that's the, that's the idea is to discover. You know, do you what really is it within you? Do you really think it's that they don't know or they're not really trusting? Because everyone has, there's something that lights them up. And I think it's like, well, they're supposed to do something or I don't know what I'm good at. But through the exploration, you know, what, what do you love to do? And, and people people kind of discount that. And I don't think that's actually yeah. something that they can do. We're well, trying to a, make it to something. Yeah, that's a, that's a, you know, I think that's right. I think that's a good observation. There's a young man coming here in a couple of days. His name is a couple of days from now. He's coming here to stay with us for a few days. His name is Bennett. He lives and works in Vietnam now. Mm. I remember when Bennett was going to Kenyon College in Ohio with my son, and his uncle had promised to help him get a job in uh, in New York City one summer, and it didn't come through for him. And he was very upset about it. And Spencer, my son Spencer, said, "Well, you know, you ought to talk to my dad. He likes helping people." And, so Bennett called me and I talked to him and I said, you know, and Bennett said, I, 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 I'll do anything. I just mm -hmm. want to be in New York. I said, that's too broad a category. I can't help you. You got to be more specific. Mm -hmm. So to your point, he, he was discounting what he really wanted to do. And I said, what is it that you are studying? What are you? And he said, well, I'm studying dance. I said, well, why don't you get a job in dance? He said, well, I'm never going to come mm -hmm. to New York and get a job in dance. You know, you just, you're like you say, Find reasons not to. I said, I, I, I remember smiling to myself and telling Bennett, I said, I want you to go to Battery Dance Company. I want you to Google Battery Dance Company. I want you to look at that. Tell me what you think. Get back to me. So he did. And he got back and he says, oh, this is the coolest dance company. He said, it, it, it's fantastic. They're, they're having a trip this year. They're taking a, a, a tour to Germany. And I speak German. I said, okay, I want you to write this all down. I want you to write me an email and tell me that you Googled 
battery dance company, they explored it, that they were going to Germany and they were really enthused about it and everything else. And he did that immediately. And I forwarded to Jonathan Hollander, who's one of my good friends and the founder of the battery dance company. Mm. And Jonathan got back to me the same day and said, geez, this guy's perfect for it. We need an intern this summer to help us. And he speaks, did you know he speaks German, Larry? And uh, so that's what Bennett did. He came to New York and he worked there. But yeah, you just, you, you should just, you know, you're right. You, you know, but the, but that, that, that process is something. But even adults, yeah. because people that I work with that are like, well, I don't know what makes me happy. What I tell them is I suggest they go back to, well, what did you do as a child that, that you got joy out of that made you happy? Because mm -hmm. we tend to, we lose that, that sense. So I think that the, the young people that you talk about that don't know what they want to do are thinking in terms of kind of like this career, this adult, what I'm supposed to. And yet, if we just go back to what just comes naturally to us and what brings us joy. But the other thing they have to do is also you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. Yeah, you have to make a decision. There's, there's a great fear of that saying. Yeah, Lewis Carroll wrote a book uh, you might be familiar with. It's called Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And there's a, probably the, the scene that's most famous for me and the most one that intrigued me the most is when Alice is down there wandering around lost in the rabbit hole. And she comes to a fork in the road. She doesn't know which way to go. And there's a Cheshire cat with a big grin on his mm -hmm. face sitting on the tree branch above her head. And she looks up at the cat and she says, which way should I go? And the cat said, where are you going? <laughs> and she said, I don't know. <laughs> and the cat said to her, then it doesn't make a difference. That's, a, that's great. Yeah, make a decision. <laughs> yeah, it may not be the right one, but it's going to lead to right. something. you got to make a decision. Right. Well, yeah. I think that's such a perfect way to wrap up this interview. <laughs> I think it's... I'm glad you made a decision to come here today. <laughs> yes, and I'm glad you made, you made a decision to say yes. Larry, yeah. it was such a pleasure to yeah. speak with you again. It was nice to, to be with you, Laura. To be in your beautiful space. Yeah. Oh, I just had this, such a nice feeling being here. Yeah. Well, thanks. So, thank you so much. Okay. We're good. Mm -hmm.